Hello everyone. For tonight, please join me in the comfort of my library, around the fireplace. Let's light the fire first, and then I'll tell you what our story is about. If you like history and a gothic atmosphere, this is going to be for you. Tonight we will explore the origins and many aspects of two mysterious, fantastic creatures, werewolves and dragons. We'll see that they existed in many different cultures and uh, different forms, and how they evolved centuries after centuries to become these fairy tales and fantasy beings we are familiar with. So we have a lot to discover, and uh, in this story we are going to cross the lines between history, legends, anthropology and fantasy. This should help us understand where these myths come from, what base they may have in reality, and how they have colonized our collective imaginary. The soft fireplace sounds have now faded away. But when we're finished with the story, in more than one hour, they will be back to lull you to sleep for a little while. As usual, you can listen with your eyes shut and easily follow along. And if you fall asleep during the story, you can always come back later to continue. There are timestamps under the video to help you resume story where you left it. I am catching up with my library of stories on music streaming platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon or Deezer, and new ones are regularly added. So if this is more convenient for you, you can go listen there. There are links in the first comment too. And if you wish to download audios and videos to keep them and be able to listen offline and at the same time have access to special surveys and support the channel, this is possible on Patreon. I have recently added lighter audio files that you can quickly put on your phone and there are about 50 hours of stories about many different topics that you can download at the moment. But for now, let's get ready for our new exploration journey. Try to adopt a comfortable position and then you can just let the sound of my voice take you to a fantasy world. So let's begin. There was a time when a werewolf scare spread across Europe, at the same time as the fear of witchcraft. And this is when our story begins, specifically at the end of the 16th century, in Germany, near Cologne, a time of big political and religious troubles. At the time, Germany was at the epicenter of Christian Reformation. Protestants and Catholics, they literally fought for influence, for the right to follow the religious precepts of their choosing, 
or sometimes to force them on others. Germany was scattered into a multitude of small states, free cities, archbishoprics, principalities. And soon all these political and religious divisions, together with the ambitions of uh, other countries, would plunge it into the Thirty Years' War. More than any other period in European history, this was the time of witch hunts. There were panic outbursts because of vampirism. And at the time, to be an outcast or to cause your neighbors to dislike you could be very dangerous. Accusations of heresy, of a pact with the devil, or unnatural practices. This could quickly lead you to trial. And this is what happened to Peter Stump, a wealthy farmer from the electorate of Cologne. The electorate of Cologne was an independent ecclesiastical principality. It consisted of the possessions of the Archbishop of Cologne, who ruled over them like a chief of state. And Peter was a, a widower with two children, and maybe because of jealousy for his wealth, maybe because he was a criminal, maybe because he had converted to Protestantism, and not at the right time, just before a new archbishop tried to reinstate Catholicism in his land, he was accused of being a werewolf. He was swiftly arrested and questioned, meaning that he was tortured, after which he confessed he had practiced black magic since he was a child. He also claimed that the devil had given him a magical belt. When he wore it, he turned into a huge wolf with sharp teeth, mighty paws, and an insatiable appetite for animal and human flesh. He confessed to killing and eating 14 children, including one of his own, two women, and uh, countless goats, lambs, and sheep. No magical belt was ever found after his arrest, but his confession and uh, various testimonies were considered sufficient to convict him. Another element that played against him is the fact that a big wolf had been spotted near the village, believed to be the werewolf. And this wolf had had its left forepaw cut off. Peter had an injury to his left hand, and this sealed his fate. He was sentenced to death. His uh, trial was publicized to warn people against letting the devil in, and maybe also against heresy. This kind of trial remained a, a singular event in Cologne, but they spread to many regions of Germany and northern France at the time, together with witch hunts. Men and women alike could be accused of witchcraft, but many more women were. Alternatively, a smaller group of mainly male individuals were accused of being werewolves and turning into bloodthirsty wolves at night. The fear of the wolf was still very much alive across Europe because attacks occasionally happened, but when the werewolf's scare spread in the 16th and 17th centuries, these wolf attacks had become very rare. Populations of wolves in Western Europe had already declined 
a lot since the Middle Ages, because forested areas were smaller, and wolves are relatively shy. They avoid humans, and their predation was mainly a problem for herds of cattle. The troubled environment at the time may help understand why these witch and werewolf hunts took place. But not specifically why a scare of humans turning into wolves. To understand it, we need to go back much further in time. Where does this concept of a human with the ability to shapeshift into a wolf come from? And is it supposed to be voluntary or a curse or a disease? The word werewolf comes from Old English werewolf with were meaning man and wolf which has become wolf. The same roots gave Werwolf in German. And it seems that when it comes to the werewolf folklore in Western and Northern Europe, a major influence was Germanic paganism. That is to say, the religion, the set of beliefs of Germanic peoples from the Iron Age until their Christianization during the Middle Ages. The transformation of men into wolves, this was a recurring feature of their mythology, and it is believed that this was an aspect of the uh, initiation of the warrior class. Symbolically, the transformation of a man into a wolf reflected the transformation of a teenager into a warrior that finds within an animal spirit and uh, the ferocity necessary to accomplish his destiny. Maybe this form of symbolic transformation is uh, even older and broader among Indo-European peoples. I told you about them in many stories about the antiquity in Europe and the Middle East already. They were peoples who migrated from the East to a large region from the north of India to Western Europe several thousand years ago in several waves. They mixed with the locals and uh, they diverged between them but they had an influence on the culture of all the regions where they settled, and they retained common features in their languages, or maybe even the organization of uh, their societies. The uh, ancient Persians, Greeks, Romans, the Celts, the Slavs, all have Indo-European origins. This would explain why a similar werewolf folkloric tradition exists in Slavic Europe and in the Balkans, without much influence from Germanic peoples in these regions. But when it comes to Western Europe, Germanic peoples spread way beyond modern Germany to France, Great Britain, Scandinavia, and they shaped the werewolf myth in the West, at least its origin. And this may explain why werewolves became associated with evil during the Middle Ages, when they were in the process of being Christianized. Werewolves were a pagan myth, one that had to be erased by the new religion. Being a werewolf had to be evil because it was synonymous with heresy. So Christianization did not make the myth disappear. It reinterpreted it in Christian terms. Now werewolves were cursed or individuals dealing with the devil. But even before this, 
and maybe because of common cultural origins between Indo-European peoples. There were already tales of men changed into wolves in classical antiquity in Greece. Greek authors told the story of King Lycan of Arcadia. There are various versions to the legend, but they all come back to the story of Lycan displeasing Zeus, the king of gods. And as punishment, Zeus turned him into a wolf. From this legend comes the term lycanthropy, which is the condition that affects werewolves. A lycanthrope is a werewolf, and it has the same meaning in Greek, lukos, wolf, and anthropos, human. There were other tales of lycanthropy in ancient Greece, other legends. One says that in Arcadia, Arcadia was located in the Peloponnese, it is in the heart of ancient Greece, and I referred to it in the recent story about Heracles. So in Arcadia, there was a particular tribe that chose a man every year, says the legend, to be escorted to a marsh in the area. The man left his clothes behind and swam across the marsh, progressively morphing into a wolf, and then he joined a pack of wolves for nine years. If he refrained from testing human flesh for these entire nine years, he could return to the marsh, swim back, and recover his human form. So, lycanthropes as a myth existed in Greek and later Roman antiquity, but they were not particularly well known, and other types of legendary creatures drew a lot more interest. What changed in the Middle Ages is that the belief that werewolves were real became widespread and not just in folkloric tales that people would tell around the fireplace. Werewolves were mentioned in medieval law codes. An example of this is the law code of King Knut at the beginning of the 11th century. Knut Swainson was a Danish prince. He ascended to the throne of England too, and for a few years, he ended up ruling over Denmark, Norway, and England, all around the North Sea. But his heirs died, and 30 years after him, the invasion of England by the Normans completely ended his legacy. Apart from lawmakers, churchmen also discussed werewolves in their works, and when they did so, it seems they were considered a fact, not just a possibility. There were dozens of supposed eyewitnesses, or at least that's what they said, who came forward all across Europe along the centuries to testify they had seen a man changing into a wolf. But this never turned into the kind of scare and uh, witch hunts that happened several centuries later, after the Middle Ages. These remained local stories that would uh, appear punctually in some places and uh, were forgotten in a few years, like for vampirism in the same period, if you listen to my other story about the history of vampires. With the progress of Christianization, the beliefs about wolfmen from Germanic paganism receded, or at least they could not be expressed freely. The one region where pagan traditions persisted longest was in Scandinavia during the Viking Age. 
in particular, there were warriors in all Norse sagas that you may have heard of, the berserkers. Literally, berserker meant someone who wears a coat made out of a bear's skin. They are less famous, but there were also warriors in wolf skin, the Ulfretnar. Berserkers and Ulfretnars were subject to fits of frenzy in battle. They could start fighting and howling like wild beasts. These wolf warriors who became inhabited by what seems to be the spirit of a wolf were sometimes described as Odin's special warriors. But they were not just mythical figures appearing in Viking poems and sagas. Some of the Viking warriors, when the Vikings went to war in the real world, entered in a state of frenzy in battle, and they wore furs of wolf or bear to indicate that they were berserkers, and that in the heat of the battle, they may not be able to tell friend from foe. It is unknown what exactly caused this state of rage. Once it was over, these men would be left weak and uh, needed several days to recover. It could have been a kind of hysteria, a madness that would have been uh, induced by rituals before the fight like howling like animals, or it could also have been a, a drug or massive amounts of alcohol. Seeds from a plant that may cause symptoms compatible with the berserker state have been discovered in a Viking tomb in Denmark, but in any case, the berserker's behavior may have inspired legends about werewolves. These warriors did not morph into animals physically, but they seemed to spiritually or mentally turn into wolves, or at least into the kind of ferocious beasts that people believed wolves to be. Given that the Vikings terrified many European regions at the turn of the millennium, this could explain that the fear of the werewolf took form in the Middle Ages. However, the myth of shapeshifters that turned into animals goes well beyond Europe. Instead of wolves, they adapt to local predators. In Africa, there are legends about were lions and were panthers and leopards. In Asia, from India to China, were tigers and uh, were jaguars in Mesoamerican cultures. So it seems that this concept of humans morphing into uh, predators or the other way around appears spontaneously in uh, cultures that are far apart. Maybe it was a way to tame the fear of nature or to acknowledge and uh, express metaphorically the wild animal part in uh, every human being, or maybe also to explain murders, possibly serial murders, or rare phenomena like cannibalism. An individual who commits such crimes must be at least partly a beast because it would be too unsettling to admit that he is part of mankind. Returning to Europe and its werewolves, I told you that the preoccupation with lycanthropy really became big after the Middle Ages, in early modern times, and that it came together with witch hunts, the two being very often associated Werewolfery was uh, only present in a small fraction of witch trials, so in this sense it was rather marginal in comparison. 
but there are records of such trials all over Europe, from Switzerland, where the first ones happened, to the Baltic, the Netherlands, Germany, France, everywhere. By the middle of the 17th century, though, this uh, belief in werewolves had disappeared almost, and uh, lycanthropy was no longer taken seriously. It seems that werewolves in the 16th century and early 17th century were like UFOs in the 20th century, in the sense that there were hundreds of people coming forward as witnesses, a lot of literature about it, so it looked too big to not at least be credible, but at the same time, no werewolf was ever captured to be studied or ever transformed in front of a court or scientists. In some of the cases, there was convincing evidence of murder or cannibalism against the accused, but no association with wolves could ever be proven. In other cases, there was evidence against wolves that had attacked people. This was rare, but it happened. But known against the persons accused of being that wolf in that case. After the 17th century, the look on lycanthropy changed in accordance with the times. It was more and more regarded as a superstition and possibly a disorder of the brain that made people become convinced that they could turn into animals. And it is true that there is a rare but documented psychiatric syndrome called clinical lycanthropy, which involves a delusion that the affected person can transform into an animal, or even is an animal. There is also a syndrome called hypertrichosis, which can have various causes and leads to an abnormal amount of hair growth over the body. And yet another condition that may have inspired the werewolf myth could be rabies, which is a viral disease with various symptoms like violent and controlled movements or even porphyria, which is a group of diseases that affect the skin and the nervous system. Maybe these medical aspects played a role, but none of them is really fully convincing. They don't explain a reversible transformation into an animal, and they are not compatible with the afflicted person having a normal social life the rest of the time. But very much like with vampires, a large set of folk beliefs had been formed and was ready to be claimed, used by literature in the 19th century. Local traditions about werewolves evolved in so many different places that this set of beliefs can be very diverse and sometimes contradictory. For example, the transformation into a wolf may be temporary or permanent, or a bit of both. A cursed individual transforms more and more often until he stays stuck in the animal state. Sometimes the person metamorphoses into a wolf, or they just transfer their spirit into a real animal. Depending on the countries, they were said to have traits in their human form that made it possible to identify werewolves. For example, the meeting of both eyebrows at the bridge of the nose, curved fingernails, or low set ears. There is a superstition in Russia 
that werewolves can be recognized by uh, bristles under their tongue. And in other countries, it was believed that one method of identifying them was to cut a bit of skin. Fur would appear within the wound. In uh, modern movies, werewolves are often portrayed as uh, anthropomorph. They do not really become wolves when they transform, but rather a half-human, half-wolf creature that can sometimes walk on two feet. This wasn't part of folkloric traditions. People believed in a complete transformation that made them almost indistinguishable from real wolves. One universal trait all over Europe, but it has not really been picked up by literature and film, was that werewolves were believed to eat recently buried corpses. And another deviation from the folklore in modern popular culture is how people become werewolves. Nowadays, it will often be because of the bite of a werewolf or because the state of werewolf is uh, genetic and parents pass it to their offspring. But these are modern interpretations and they were not part of the various methods for becoming a werewolf. One of the most common was that the transformation happened voluntarily when people put on a belt made of wolf skin or the entire animal skin. In uh, other cases, the transformation happened when the body was rubbed with the magic ointment elaborated by a witch or just by drinking rainwater from the footprint of an actual wolf. Or, of course, by pledging allegiance to Satan. In Italy, Germany and France, it was said that someone who slept outdoors when the full moon was shining directly on their face could be turned this belief that links werewolves to the moon and gives them special strength or forces them to transform when the moon is full has also been picked up by gothic literature and movies. There were also remedies to bring people back and cure a victim of lycanthropy. Some of them were relatively soft in Schleswig-Holstein, in Germany, a werewolf could be cured just by addressing it three times by its Christian name. One Danish belief was that just scolding a werewolf would cure it. Other remedies were more extreme. Exorcism could be a method, and so could various potions. These medicinal potions generally used wolf's pain, also known as aconite. It is a plant native to mountainous regions of the northern hemisphere and it makes beautiful flowers. Now the problem is that several species of aconites are also very toxic. Since the antiquity, Aconite has been used to make poisons, including arrow poisons. So many of the cures advocated by medieval doctors were actually deadly to the patients. In German and English folklore, werewolves were also presented as highly resistant to injuries. But one thing could hurt them, silver. This feature appeared relatively late, in the 19th century, but most modern fiction uses it, too. So, we were now reaching the 18th century, and at the time, 
old beliefs were under attack from many intellectuals, philosophers, scientists. They were called superstitions, or they were attempts at rationalizing them, finding scientific medical explanations. But it doesn't mean folklore and old beliefs disappeared, especially in more rural and remote areas. As scholars in Vienna, Berlin, Paris or London were developing the scientific method and questioning beliefs that had existed for centuries, these same beliefs remained very much a part of the life of most people. And the scare of the supernatural had not disappeared. Attacks by wolves became exceptional in Western Europe in more densely populated countries like Germany, France, the Netherlands or England, they were extinct by the 17th, 18th centuries, except in very specific remote regions. But they remained a reality in Scandinavia, Eastern Europe and Russia for much longer because of the geography. There were vast areas of woods with few people. One last scare about wolves in Western Europe was the incident of the Beast of Gévaudan, which happened in France in the 18th century, precisely in the south center of the country, in a very rural region that was scarcely populated and where wolves still lived. People started to report attacks by a a terrifying creature, looking like an enormous wolf, but with a long tail and formidable teeth and claws. Over the course of three years, dozens of people were attacked and killed, prompting hunting parties and even a royal intervention to end it. Several large wolves were killed, and it was believed several times that this was finally over. But the attacks always resumed shortly after. Survivors and witnesses described an unknown beast. They compared it with a wolf, because this was what they knew. But it didn't really match the description of a wolf especially the type of clothes or the long tail they described. And there were dozens of testimonies all saying the same thing, and also so many attacks that there is little doubt something really happened. Finally, the attacks stopped, and the mystery remained unresolved. Maybe the attacks were the work of several big wolves, or packs of wolves. Or another possible explanation is that a lion, a tiger, or maybe even a liger. Because lions and tigers can reproduce, and their offspring can be huge in size. Their interbreeding eliminates a gene that limits the size of the two species. So maybe one of the exotic animals that lived in a private zoo escaped and uh, the beast found a way to survive in the woods by uh, attacking herds and uh, isolated people. Descriptions don't really match that of a big cat, neither. So, the beast of Gévaudan will probably remain a mystery. At the time, and this is revealing of how mentalities has already changed, almost no one commented that there was something supernatural or that evil was acting. One or two centuries earlier, this would have been the go-to explanation, and uh, a witch hunt would have probably occurred. 
This is quite telling about the uh, evolution of ideas, the way people uh, of the 18th century now saw the world. At this point, it would have seemed uh, reasonable to uh, expect that werewolves would be forgotten. But they were not. Very much like vampires, ghosts, spirits, and uh, even uh, paganism in general, they went through a revival in the 19th century. This was the moment when European national folklores started to be studied as a part of each country's heritage and also as a literary object. There was more and more interest in medieval traditions and even pre-Christian times, Old Norse mythology, Germanic paganism. The Celts became very much in fashion and there was also a taste for the occult. All the Western fantasy literature from the 20th century has its roots in this rediscovery, not just werewolves or vampires. Elves, fairies, dragons, magicians and witches, they have evolved over the past two centuries, but they all have their origins as uh, fiction characters in the 19th century folklore studies and uh, this renewed interest for medieval or even older traditions. And this is how the fiction werewolves came to us. They were alluded to in the works of Bram Stoker, the author of the novel Dracula, but they really entered public consciousness in the 20th century, in the 1930s and 1940s, at a time when people had already had quite a lot of vampire movies, and it felt like a good time to introduce a new type of creature. There was a film from 1935, Werewolf of London, which was the first to introduce a hybrid between man and wolf, an anthropomorphic werewolf, which was a break from the long tradition of werewolves turning into real wolves. The first movie to feature the transformative effect of the full moon was from 1943. Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. From then, it became a widespread feature. There were more movies in the 70s and 80s, like An American Werewolf in London. Over time, werewolves have become more and more neutral. They can be male-violent, but also heroic depending on the stories. They really became big in the past 30 years, especially in uh, comic books, anime, novels, movies for teenagers, like the Twilight or Underworld series. Maybe it's like for vampires. We are at a peak, or we recently were, and there will be less of them in the near future, but they are still very popular and most people know what to expect about them now. So let's move to our second topic of the night, dragons. Let me start by telling you a story that will sound familiar, one way or another. Once upon a time, long ago, when there were still emperors in Rome, there was a brave Greek soldier who was a member of the Praetorian Guard, 
the elite unit of the Imperial Roman army that protected the emperors. Praetorian Guard went on missions for the emperor too, and George, that was his name, was sent to Libya. In Libya, there was a city, Silene, that was terrorized by a fierce dragon. To prevent the monster from attacking and destroying the city, the people gave it two sheep every day. But that was not always enough. And sometimes the dragon also required them to sacrifice humans. The human to be sacrificed was elected by the city's people. At the time George was in Silene, the king's daughter was chosen to be sacrificed. As no one would accept to take her place, George decided he wouldn't let the princess die, nor the tyranny of the dragon go on in the province. So he confronted the monster, and after a terrible fight, he killed it with his lance. When he returned to the city, the king was so grateful that he offered him treasures for saving his daughter's life. But George was also generous and uh, uninterested in worldly fortune. He gave everything to the poor and his example amazed and inspired all people from the city who decided to be baptized and became Christians like George. This is the legend of Saint George and the Dragon, which is also the archetypal story of a hero rescuing a princess from a monster. In Western iconography, Saint George is almost always pictured with a spear and slaying a dragon. By the end of the Middle Ages, everyone in Europe knew about this legend. Its oldest known traces are from a Georgian text from the 11th century. From there, it spread to the Byzantine world and via the Crusades, it reached the rest of Europe. At first it was told in aristocratic circles as a chivalric, fantastic story, and in the 13th century it was popularized and it became a favorite literary subject. The George who became Saint George lived in the 3rd century, he was an early Christian, and he was a soldier. It seems the legend about him slaying the dragon appeared long after he died. The legend also reflects how dragons are typically portrayed in Western cultures. They are monsters to be tamed or overcome by heroes. They often breathe fire, they are very strong, they can fly, and occasionally they live in caves and uh, keep treasures. Fantasy dragons, including from recent stories, all burrow on these traits. But this is just one aspect of these creatures, because very much like the belief in uh, humans morphing into predators we have explored with werewolves. Dragons appear in the folklore of many cultures around the world, in Asia, in the Middle East, and in Europe. Chinese dragons are also rather familiar. They don't really fly, at least they have no wings, but they sort of float in the air and they resemble more snakes with small legs. But there is more to dragons, 
So let's just find out where they came from. Serpentine mythical creatures are almost universal around the globe. Be it in America, in Africa, in Europe, in Asia. Our ancestors believed in and sometimes worshipped dragon-like or at least snake-like monsters. And this universality raises the question of why do they appear spontaneously? One hypothesis is that humans have inherited instinctive fear reactions to snakes, large cats, and even birds of prey from thousands and thousands of generations when staying away from them was a matter of life or death. It still is in some parts of the world. It has been observed, for example, that the fear of snakes is uh, especially prominent in children, including in areas where snakes are very rare. Growing up in the modern world, many people overcome later the fear of snakes. But they remain a group of animals that is generally disliked. So it is not impossible that dragons appear in nearly all cultures because of an innate fear of snakes and other animals that were predators of human's primate ancestors. It is true that the earliest pictures of dragons discovered all resemble large snakes with a few other elements taken from big cats and birds of prey. Another source of inspiration could be the ancient discovery of fossils and also the knowledge of existing reptiles that would have been exaggerated. If you take into account crocodiles, alligators, iguanas, komodo dragons, different species of lizards. Most ancient civilizations and the different cultures were in contact or knew about these species. Fossils could also have been an inspiration in China, India or around the ancient Mediterranean world. The remains of ancient species were discovered and people had no explanation for them. For example, there was an extinct species of giraffe that left a lot of fossils in the Mediterranean region, called Samotherium. The skulls can easily make you think of a dragon with two horns. In China, too. Fossils of large prehistoric animals are very common and these remains are often called dragon bones. They are an ingredient in Chinese traditional medicine. Now the explanation by fossils has its limitations too. For example, Scandinavia has a lot of stories about dragons and sea monsters. But as far as we know, its inhabitants had no knowledge of large fossil bones. So let's take a look at these uh, forms that giant serpents or dragons took in various ancient cultures. We're going to see that the modern fantasy dragon is uh, coming from very far. In Egyptian mythology, there were various giant snakes resembling dragons. One of them was Apep, a serpent that lived in the underworld. According to an ancient Egyptian tradition, the passing of days and nights resulted from an eternal fight between the sun god Ra and Apep. The setting of the sun was caused by Ra descending to the underworld to battle the serpent. Earthquakes and uh, thunderstorms 
were thought to be caused by Apep's roar, and an explanation for solar eclipses during daytime was that Apep had left the underworld to attack Ra. Another giant serpent from Egyptian mythology was Denwen. Its body was made of fire, and he was defeated by a pharaoh. This victory against such a, a dreadful creature was supposed to affirm the pharaoh's right to rule. The Egyptians also invented a symbol called the Ouroboros, a circle made from a serpent or a dragon swallowing its own tail. It is believed that this emblem represented the cyclical nature of everything, days, years, life. There must have been something appealing about this symbol, because from Egypt it entered Western tradition via Greece. It became associated with magic in ancient Greece, and especially with the practice of alchemy. As such, it stayed an alchemy symbol. It appeared in alchemy treaties as an esoteric emblem amongst others like the sun, the moon or Mercury. It is unclear whether it came from the Mediterranean world or whether it was reinvented far in the north, but the Ouroboros also appears in Norse mythology as a, a serpent that grew so large that it could uh, encircle the world and uh, grasp its tail in its teeth. The uh, Egyptian Ouroboros was clearly a serpent, but in the west it evolved into a dragon with uh, wings and legs. In Mesopotamia too, since the third millennium BC, at least, there were artworks representing giant serpentine monsters. In Babylon, people believed and called for the protection of the Mishusu, which had the body of a snake, the four legs of a lion, and the hind legs of a bird. Probably independently from these, dragons appeared in China and this is probably the culture where they have become the most prominent. The origins of the Chinese dragons are vague, but the first depictions can be found thousands of years ago on Neolithic pottery. There is a wealth of legends about dragons in China. They are generally more benevolent than in Western tradition, and they are depicted as noble animals. They were supposed to be the highest ranking creatures in the Chinese animal hierarchy. There's a famous Chinese story about the zodiac. It says that long ago, the first god, the Jade Emperor, wanted to select 12 animals to be his guards. So he sent an immortal being into man's world to uh, announce that the earlier one went through the heavenly gate, the better the rank one would receive. The next day, many animals set off towards the heavenly gate. The first to come near the gate was the rat, but he encountered a river that blocked the path. The rat was unable to cross, but he saw a second animal, the ox, that was also traveling to the gate and about to cross the river. So he jumped into its ear and crossed with the ox. On the other side, he quickly jumped out of the ear and sprinted to the gate, which made him first, the first animal of the zodiac. 
followed by the ox. Then came the tiger and the rabbit. And in fifth place was the dragon, which was the best looking, bravest and more powerful of them all. The Jade Emperor noticed this and was so delighted with the dragon that he offered the following place, the sixth place, to the dragon's son. But the dragon didn't come with his son. And uh, the snake, which was astute and crafty, came forward at this moment and said that the dragon was its adoptive father. So the snake ranked sixth. And then came six more animals, horse, goat, monkey, rooster, dog and pig. Together they are the twelve animals of the Chinese zodiac and uh, come back for a dedicated year, a longer twelve years cycle. As the history of China advanced, dragons became more and more prestigious. By the late imperial China, they were strongly associated with emperors, and the emperor of China was uh, the only one who had the right to uh, feature dragons on his clothing or personal items. There are literally dozens of legends involving dragons. One of them tells of a man called Dongfu, who loved dragons and could understand them so well that he was able to tame and raise them. He was called to serve the emperor and received the name of Wan Long, the dragon raiser. Another story involving a dragon trainer takes place under the Chia dynasty, the very first dynasty in traditional Chinese historiography that would have ruled 4,000 years ago. In reality, a majority of scholars consider this dynasty to be just mythical rather than real. But so is probably the story with dragons. The emperor had received two dragons from the god of heaven, male and female, as a reward for his obedience. But he couldn't train them, so he hired a dragon trainer who happened to be a pupil of Wan Long, the one from the previous story. But one day the female dragon died unexpectedly under his watch. Secretly, the trainer chopped her up and served her cooked meat to the emperor. The emperor liked it so much that he asked the trainer for another identical meal. As he had no way of finding more dragon meat and could not come to terms with killing the male dragon, the trainer had to flee the palace and disappear. One of the most famous stories is about the Dragon King, which is a water and weather god from ancient Chinese religion. But this god has adapted to the evolution of religions in China and remains very well known. He is the one celebrated in dragon boat races. Nowadays, these races of man-powered boats are even an international competition in Hong Kong. But their origin dates back to 2000 years ago, from the Guangdong province in the south of China. The dragon god, or dragon king, has four different aspects that are associated with seas and lakes. As a green dragon, it is the god of the East and the patron of the East China Sea. It can also be a red dragon that rules in the South and the South China Sea. As a black dragon, it is the ruler of the North and Lake Baikal, 
which is located in Russia nowadays, or the North China Sea. And finally, as a white dragon, it is the god of the West and resides inside Qinghai Lake, the largest lake in China. Apart from dragon boat racing, another Chinese custom that also revolves around dragons is the dragon dance, which takes place during the spring festival, the celebration of the Chinese New Year. People construct a long dragon, typically 16 foot long, from bamboo strips, cloth and paper, which is uh, paraded through the city. The original purpose of this ritual was to worship the dragon god and bring good weather and a good harvest. Nowadays it is uh, done mainly for good luck and entertainment. In Asia, dragons are not limited to China. There are also similar traditions in Korea, Japan, Vietnam. In all these countries, the cultural influence of China is very strong, and their dragons resemble the Chinese ones. In Korea, dragons are often depicted with a longer beard, and are generally benevolent. They bring rain, and as in China, they are related to water and agriculture. In Korean folk mythology, dragons begin their lives as emojis, or lesser dragons, which are said to resemble big serpents. In order to become fully-fledged dragons, they must survive 1,000 years or overcome a curse that has made them unable to become dragons. In Japan, dragons appear without wings and with three claws. They are associated with bodies of water and rainfall. These are just a few examples, but in uh, India, too, in Mesoamerica, they were large serpentine creatures, often with wings, legs and claws. So there is little doubt that creatures of a similar appearance tend to uh, pop up in almost every ancient culture. Now let's return to Europe and see how the Western fantasy dragon was born. In Greek mythology, there were multiple dragon-like creatures. We don't know where they come from, but possible origins include Indo-European myth. All Indo-European peoples had myths involving dragons, and the Proto-Greeks were Indo-Europeans. It could also be through contacts with the Near East and Egypt, where mythological dragons also existed. Or maybe the Greeks recreated them, since dragons seem to appear spontaneously. The most fearsome monster in all Greek mythology was probably Typhon. It was a horrible creature with 100 serpent heads that could breathe fire. Zeus confronted it and scorched all its heads with lightning bolts, after which Typhon was exiled to Tartarus, hell for the ancient Greeks. Another large serpent was Python, slayed by god Apollo near the city of Delphi, after freeing the Delphi area from the monster, Apollo set up his uh, shrine there. There was also the uh, Hydra from the swamps of Lerna, slayed by uh, Heracles as one of his labors. In the quest of the Golden Fleece, 
Hero Jason had to slay a dragon, too. There are more examples in literature and uh, mythology. But surprisingly also in uh, accounts that were supposed to be real. In the 5th century BC, the uh, Greek writer Herodotus, he is famous for being the first known historian in the sense that he wrote about the past after inquiries and uh, research. He did not just write chronicles that glorified kings or repeated legends. But still, he had limited archives, and what he wrote was sometimes far from accurate. In one of his books, he claimed that Libya was inhabited by monstrous serpents. There is no other evidence of this, but if you remember, the legend of St. George that we talked about at the beginning, that appeared centuries later, was also located in Libya, and maybe there were tales about this already for a long time, repeated or invented by Herodotus. In another book, he states that Arabia was home to winged snakes, with little wings looking like bat wings. In the 2nd century BC, a Greek astronomer named the constellation Draco, the dragon, the world comes from Greek, which indicates that this type of animal was rather familiar in people's mind. A few centuries later, a Roman author claimed that dragons lived in Ethiopia, far to the south and Ethiopia would have been inhabited by a species of large dragons that hunted elephants and could grow to the length of 180 feet. The connections between Greek and Roman antiquity and European pagan mythologies are unclear. We don't exactly know what influence it may have had but dragons were also abandoned in Germanic and Norse mythologies. These are all the elements, all the influences that combined to develop the Western image of dragons in Europe during the Middle Ages. The snake-like dragons from Greco-Roman literature, references to dragons from the Near East, that sometimes appeared in the Bible, and the Bible at the time in Christian medieval Europe was not a book to be questioned, so anything that appeared in it had to be considered absolutely real. And also European traditions from before Christianization. At this point in the Middle Ages, there were so many sources including from far away in the past, that the existence of dragons looked absolutely plausible. Many people thought that they were real, living creatures. So dragons appeared in texts in which their anatomy was described, very much like our modern fantasy dragons, large wings, powerful jaws, horns, strong legs with claws. A famous medieval tale, including dragons, is an anecdote I told you about in the story about Arthurian legends. In the 12th century, a monk from Wales redacted Historia Regum Britanniae, which is a fantasy account of the history of the kings of Britain and one of the founding texts of Arthurian literature. In the story, the young Merlin witnesses a warlord, Vortigern, attempting to build a tower in Wales to keep safe from the Anglo-Saxons. But the tower keeps being swallowed into the ground. 
Merlin informs Vortigern that underneath the foundations is a pool with two dragons sleeping in it. And this is the reason why the tower keeps sinking. The pool is drained and uh, two dragons are awakened. The red one symbolizing Wales and the white one for England. They start fighting and the white dragon triumphs, announcing the victory of England over Wales. We've seen earlier that dragons in East Asia were more benevolent. In medieval Europe, they were not. They became threatening figures, generally greedy, voracious, and living in rivers or having a cave or an underground lair. The legend of Saint George that reached Western Europe after the First Crusades only cemented the reputation of dragons as forces of evil. And yet, because they were also powerful and uh, frightening, they also became a popular symbol in uh, heraldry, like lions or towers. By the end of the Middle Ages, and even more in the following centuries, the hypothesis that dragons were real began to recede, because they were nowhere to be found. In the West, they turned into fabulous creatures in fairy tales, so they stayed in public consciousness, and obviously they came to mind with the first steps of paleontology in the 18th century, when the fossils of large prehistoric creatures like dinosaurs started to be systematically studied. In the 19th century, there was no fantasy literature as we define it today. It is really something that was introduced in the 20th century, especially starting with Tolkien. Fantasy immediately made a heavy use of dragons, starting with Smog from the novel The Hobbit. It's responsible for spreading or popularizing the image of the greedy dragon keeping its treasure in a, a cave, even though dragons keeping treasures already existed before in fairy tales and chivalry stories. Many authors have introduced their own stories with dragons since then, each of them with their particular take on dragons, but their anatomy and their behavior is uh, immediately recognizable. They are like uh, an emblem of fantasy, from Dungeons and Dragons to Harry Potter. Another aspect of dragons that was introduced in the 20th century is the friendly dragon in uh, children's literature, and this seems uh, really appealing to kids, maybe because the dragon becomes a powerful ally to battle the child's fear and make him feel special. Interestingly, in recent years, the depiction of dragons in films has changed a little for more realism and to take into account discoveries in paleontology. They are now depicted walking on their back feet and the wrists of their wings, like it is assumed pterosaurs did, for example in the Hobbit movies or in the Game of Thrones series. So this is it. Our stories are over for tonight and I hope you enjoyed this exploration of the origins of supernatural fantasy creatures. You can now drift to restful sleep or pick another story to accompany you the comforting 
crackling sound of the fire is now going to return for a little while. Sweet dreams. Au revoir.